Dear WIGO members, partners, and friends from around the world, welcome to the WIGO e Government Thematic Group webinar. I'm Elena Cho, a program manager at WIGO Secretariat. Thank you for joining us today. Today, we are launching WIGO's new thematic group on e-government. Uh, we hope we government group activities can help our members to step up their smart city ecosystems. Before we continue, I would like to deliver some housekeeping rules for today's webinar. The webinar will be conducted in English. Please make sure that you have updated the Zoom to the latest version in order to access all functions of the Zoom webinar. For any technical issues, please write a comment in the chat box and technical team will do their best to assist you. Also kindly use the rename function to change your name to full name and affiliation. We would also like to ask you to turn off your camera and microphone unless you're one of the speakers in today's event. Also for the speakers, please turn on your camera and microphone whenever it is your turn to speak. We encourage everyone to participate actively in the webinar by submitting questions to speakers through the Q&A box. During the Q&A session in the open discussion, we will address some of the submitted questions to speakers directly. Today's webinar will be recorded and you will be, have, uh, you will be able to access the recording, including the presentation materials after the event through the WIGA's webpage. Lastly, to all of you who joined us today, a short survey will be circulated at the end of the webinar, and we would appreciate it if you can fill in the post-event survey from the, to express your feedback to uh, today's event. Now, let me walk you through today's program. Uh, we will open the program with the welcome remark from the Secretary General of WIGO, and then the Mayor of Shiraz. In the first session, we will hear about the evolution of e-government, and in the second session, we will discuss the ecosystem of e-government with various stakeholders in the field. Now, to begin our program, allow me to invite our uh, Secretary General Kyung Yeo Lee, uh, Secretary General Wigo, to deliver his welcome remarks. Mr. Lee, uh, please welcome. Please uh, turn on your microphone and camera. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me and see me well. Good morning and good afternoon. I'm happy to welcome you to the first meeting of the e-government group. Special thanks go to Mayor Eskandarpur of Shiraz because it's him who first proposed the idea of launching thematic groups. Today, we start with e-government, but there will be other thematic groups as well. The reason I propose to start with e-government is that I believe it's the most fundamental thing for a smart city. I never know an example of a good smart city without good e-government. Build e-government if you want a smart city. No e-government, no smart city. In top ranking smart cities like Seoul, Korea, all the municipal administrative jobs are digitalized so that it takes only a couple seconds to issue a document like birth certificate. A good e-government enables you to implement all the smart, smart policies like smart security, smart transportation, and, and smart everything. It also provides you with uh, a, a platform for civic participation. The current COVID-19 has re-emphasized the importance of e-government. When face-to-face -face interaction is impossible or discouraged, digital government solutions become vitally important. More than 80% of countries now offer online services to the citizens. E-government is not an option, but an obligatory governmental service. The important question is how we develop it to uh, enable comprehensive smart city planning and implementation. WIGO was born 11 years ago to do this. As you remember, the acronym WIGO stood for World E-Government Organization. From that, we expanded our mandate to work on all aspects of smart cities. But as I said, E-Government remains as the central priority for Smart City. Having said that, I promise that we will keep organizing useful meetings throughout multiple years. We'll cover all the necessary features of e-government, 
and will organize online and offline offline and offline uh, training sessions as well. I hope our members will benefit from this group and learn from each other. We'll also expect that you will actively tell us what you need. We look, we look forward to seeing successful results and I hope you will enjoy our first meeting today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Esther Lee. Now, please welcome our second uh, welcome remarks made by Mr. Hidal Iskandal, the mayor of Shiraz. Please welcome him. It's a pre-recorded video, so we will be playing the video very shortly. سلام خداوند جانافرین از شهر زیبا و تاریخی شیراز شهرهای هوشمند داشتن که این پیشنهادی از طرف شهرداری شیراز ارائه شد خوشحالم که با پشتیبانی جناب دبیر و کل همکاران ما در مجموعه شهرداری شیراز و دبیرخانه شهرهای هوشمند امروز شاهد اولین وبینار در این حوزه هستیم با وجود اینکه به دلیل شرایط بیماری کرونا شرایط محدود کننده ای رو داریم اما پلتفرم‌های مجازی خب این فرصت رو فراهم کردند که ما بتونیم در این زمینه با هم دیگه گفتگو کنیم امیدوارم با پایان یافتن این شرایط بتوانیم در شهر شیراز میزبان همه شما باشیم به با امید روزهای بهتر و آینده روشنتر در شهر شیراز Thank you, Mayor Iskandal, for the kind remarks. Um, now, please welcome one of our colleagues, Mr. Indy Park, who will give you a short presentation about WIGO and its new initiatives on e-government thematic groups. Ms. Park, when you're ready, please start the presentation. <laughs> um, good afternoon from Seoul. I'm Indy Park, an officer at WIGO. Uh, let me briefly introduce our organization and we go with government thematic group. We go, uh, next please. Next please. Okay. We go is an international organization of local government, corporations and institutions committed to the transformation of cities into smart system cities. Next please. We go's vision to create sustainable cities for all. We promote and facilitate the transformation of cities to smart sustainable cities worldwide by acting as a global platform. We foster international exchange, cooperation, and networking among our members. Next, please. Currently, WIGO has 230 members, uh, 158 local government, 36 corporations, and 19 institutions. Next, please. WIGO's activities can be divided into four main categories, knowledge sharing, networking, capacity building, project implementation, and knowledge building and research. Among the various activities carried out by WIGO, today I want to highlight the WIGO e-government thematic group. Next, please. Next, please. E-government is one of the main pillars of small cities, playing a vital role 
in enabling comprehensive integration of advanced services. With the global COVID-19 pandemic, its role is proving to be more important than ever. As social distancing policies make physical access to local government services difficult, e-government systems have become crucial to ensure that citizens still can have their basic needs met. Um, next, please. Wigo envisions the thematic group to be a platform for knowledge sharing on this important theme to assist our members in creating small sustainable cities for all. Series of activities will include seminars, workshops, training programs, and feasibility studies focused on the theme. Next, please. The thematic group refers to a series of activities focused on this topic. Four members with a particular interest in this topic and who wish to be part of coming up with the next activities, please indicate this interest in the post-event survey, which will be shared after this webinar or by simply dropping us an email. All members will, of course, be invited to any event or activity WIGO does. So if you're not interested, that's all right. You will, be, you will still be informed. For non-members, if you're really keen on taking part in this group's activities, please indicate so on the survey or just drop us an email after the event, and we can discuss it further from there. Next, please. Today is the first event to introduce the concept of e-government thematic group, and we will discuss the evolution of e-government. We will also answer questions such as how local government improved their e-government services to become more pragmatic and beneficial to citizens, what struggles do local governments face in upgrading their e-government systems and how can these be overcome. With this webinar, we hope to share the latest trends from the leading cities and experts in the field. As the first event this series, we look forward to seeing you again in our next series of e-government thematic group. Next, please. Finally, a thank you to the mayor of Shiraz for this idea. As our Secretary General Lee mentioned, it was Shiraz which originally approached the Secretary with this idea, and then the idea was developed to become this thematic group. In a similar manner, if you have any suggestions, proposals for collaboration with WIGO, please do not hesitate to let us know, as we are always happy to create new initiative with our members. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Park. Now, moving on to the first session, the pioneers of e-government will share the actions they have undertaken to achieve the developments in government we enjoy today. We have invited four speakers from UNPOG, the UN Project Office on Governance, CLID, Korean Local Information Research and Development Institute, Wellington City, and SUSA, Seoul Urban Solutions Agency. I am delighted to invite the first speaker for today, Mr. Ki Ping Yao, the Senior Governance and Public Administration Expert of UNPOG, uh, DPDG, and UN DENSA. Mr. Yao, if you're ready, please begin your presentation and don't forget to turn on your camera and microphone. Thank you, Alina. Yeah. Please, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my great privilege to present uh, on the um, evolution of e-government and the future improvements. Yeah. So my views are based on discussions of our recent digital government related activities, including an expert group meeting in March this year and the series of regional consultations in preparation for the United Nations e-government survey 2022 since last month and the webinar on digital transformation in October 2021 during uh, uh, 2020, sorry, during which the Secretary General of WIGO also shared his inside views and the findings from the UN e-government survey 2020. Uh, and also I would like to uh, um, state that my views uh, do not necessarily represent the official stance of DPI, DGU and DESA. Next, please. Uh, <clears throat> the United Nations Project Office on Governance was established in 2006 and uh, so we are part of the Division for Public Institution um, and Digital Government, UN, UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Now we are coming to the 15th anniversary. And also uh, we have uh, three uh, uh, mandates and uh, one mandate is to promote innovation for inclusive service delivery in specific sectors 
And also, we also have one mandate to um, strengthen government capacity of developing countries to develop open innovation system to engage societies. Yeah. So digital government has been uh, one of the core areas of UNPOG since its uh, inception in 2006. Next, please. Before we move to the uh, how to further improve the e-government, uh, we also have uh, in we can also discern some common challenges in developing countries in e-government. For example, the lack of buying from political leaders and senior officials. Um, countries may adopt the project manager approach. They uh, took some uh, standalone technical engineering uh, approach to the uh, technical problems. So they are also focus more on technical aspects, not considering social and political uh, dimensions. Yeah, and also demand for e services are very limited, uh, and also there's a limited capacity from officials, government officials, and other stakeholders to design and manage a digital government program. Next, please. So now I come into some uh, general common uh, uh, trends of uh, e government or digital government. So first of all, there's an increasing, uh, uh, um, in, how to say, uh, uh, embracing by the member states on the nexus of the digital government, digital economy, digital society, and the SDGs. Advancing digital economy and digital society by embracing uh, e-government development and the digital transformation is increasingly perceived perceive as a key facilitator and a driver of national development as well as a sustainable development. Next, please. And also this is the chart about uh, ITU. Uh, it has a detailed analysis of how a digital government innovation can uh, support the achievement of individual SDGs. Next, please. Second, uh, about evolution in government is about a digital government strategy and the digital government services should be aligned with SDGs. Yeah? So actually the global COVID-19 has reinvigorated the central role of e-government, uh, particularly digital government services have played a critical role for social distancing and online uh, transactions. As the UN Secretary General uh, noted, the past, the post COVID-19 world will be different and much more digital than before. So the way forward uh, is a new digital normal in responding to global challenges and pursuing sustainable development. Next, please. The third one is a, a um, trend is about the, the digital government should be uh, people-centric and user-friendly with good uh, measurement of impact and user satisfaction. Actually, according to the UN e-government survey 2020, um, close to 90% of our member states, their national portal functions are increasing they have more advanced e government uh, have more uh, advanced e government features like a one stop shop social network opportunities and an increase interactive design with the feedback options yeah so there's all, all more availability of feedback channels from the citizens yeah next please and also it's important to establish decentralized platforms and and ensure interoperability for quality integrated digital services. There should be like whole of a government approach for centralized platform, such as a digital identity or data sharing or publishing data platforms. And also the interoperability is essential for integrated services. The interoperability standard would enable developers to put together new solutions very quickly as they're in, in, interoperable and easy to work together and function well. And also many countries, uh, they are uh, um, already established a digital ID system to ensure that, uh, that everyone can be uh, included in service delivery. And also to ensure the integrated services, you know, we should break down the silos across government, both horizontally and vertically. And also we should also provide incentives for digitalization within the public institutions for partnership. Next, please. Also, local e-government development is very important. They play an important role in enabling effective, efficient, and inclusive local governance and service delivery at the local level. It enables local authorities and stakeholders to effectively identify the needs of citizens at the local level, deliver, deliver services and assistance in an effective way and a timely manner, and facilitate effective and efficient communications with the citizens. Yeah? 
Actually, the UN also, um, uh, in collaboration with the uh, UN University, we have the so-called local on service online service index in the e UN e-government survey. And also the local e-government uh, development strategy should be integrated aligned with the national e-government development strategies with a coherent and holistic approach to effective national local coordination and collaboration. And also uh, uh, UNDESA, UNPOC and uh, CARILA um, we will organize one forum on July 7th on accelerating digital transformation of local government for emerging the response and the revitalization of the local economy in the post COVID 19 era. So we welcome you to join this uh, uh, forum next month. Next, please. And also, the digital inclusion should be a priority uh, while delivering target services for vulnerable groups. Vulnerable groups should, should, should be engaged in service designing for meeting their special needs. Actually, leaving no one behind means leaving no one offline. Uh, and also uh, for many governments, they already now embrace the principle of a digital by default, eh? but the government should be uh, mindful of providing options and enabling those who have difficulty accessing digital services. And also governments should be mindful of the, digital gap, the existing digital gaps Actually, uh, those kind of people uh, in the society who have a problem in the qualities, in the digital, uh, in access and digital services, they might be further left behind. And also we should have a platform for inclusion, for e-participation policy dialogue. And also the context matters. We should also design the service, uh, design the services with the vulnerable group's ability and capacity in mind. Next, please. And also mobile platforms now become more important for service provision. So we should design the service more uh, mobile friendly and also we should have mobile strategy. The web-centric service should be integrated with the service delivery through mobile platform, including social media channel. Next, please. And also we should integrate the online and offline services through the blended services and the multi-channel delivery. The government service center in many developing countries like one-stop uh, one shop shop service center, they are still critical, especially for those people without the digital skills or internet accessibility. Next, please. The e-participation for e empowerment and e-collaboration. We should provide some innovative solutions for citizen engagement, especially for those digitally uh, in excluded. In many countries, the e-participation platforms has a trend towards multi-function uh, participating platforms, such as ideation, forums, consultations, or e-participation on new policies, opinion surveys, complaint system, reports of corruption, and the generation of ideas and innovations. Next, please. And also the data-centric, next. Yeah, data-centric and the data governance. Now that many governments are, uh, are, are put a great emphasis on the value of, of data, so, uh, um, so data centric is a general trend, but uh, with uh, more data use, we should have uh, data governance. We, uh, why are we harnessing the public value from data? We need a long-term vision and approach, uh, which requires a, a, a framework for data governance, which uh, may include the building blocks of policies, regulation, the national data strategy and leadership, data access and data uh, uh, technologies. Next, please. And also agility. So because the, now the uh, challenges are, are very kind of changing very rapidly. So government from the formulation to our policies to adjusting the communicating to citizens are very important. And also we need to have some uh, uh, advanced technology to implement these agile policies. Next, please. And also open I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Yao. Can you please uh, wrap up in one minute? <laughs> okay, sure, sure. It's a very big topic actually. And also open government data. Uh, many countries have a trend to open more data sets, but we should also have a statistic on use and impact of open government data. And also uh, the partnership, next please. The partnership with the private sector and other stakeholders, uh, especially uh, during the COVID-19 period, the, op the partnership has uh, grown in an unprecedented scale. We should have the open innovation and our PPPP, especially the investment from private sector in ICT infrastructure. Next, please. Yeah, we also should have a change mindset and enhancing digital capacity of government officials, yeah. 
we should nurture the digital skills in the public sector for digital transformation. And also government should set and change the mindset to embrace uh, digital transformation. And also lastly, it's about AI enabled. Uh, next please, yeah, about AI enabled. Next please. But AI enabled and other front te te technology in driving anticipatory, predictive, and uh, responsive services, especially in the post COVID 19 era. Yeah, okay. So now I just uh, give you a very kind of overview of some online training toolkits our office has been developing over the past several years. We have the toolkits on the uh, government innovation, social inclusion, and the risk informed governance and innovative technology for disaster risk reduction and resili resilience. And also we have a digital for sustainable development toolkit. And also we have this online toolkit on e-government for women's empowerment in Asia and the Pacific in collaboration with the UNS gap. Thank you. Yeah. Back to you, Elena. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Yeah. It gave us, uh, the presentation gave us an overview of how the government progress with digitalization of government services with people-centric approach. Um, for audiences, if you have questions about Mr. Yao's presentation, uh, please uh, send them in through our chat box function and we will be addressing them at the end of the, the webinar. For the next presenter, I would like to invite Mr. Sang Yun Kim, the Director for External Cooperation Korea, Local Information Research and Build Institute. Mr. Sang Yun Kim, uh, you may have the floor. Please don't forget to turn on your camera and microphone, and the presentation time given is five minutes. Um, if you're ready, please begin your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll try to make this as, as, as short as possible. Obviously, I don't have a whole lot of time, so jumping right in. Um, I'm the director for external affairs within the uh, CLID or the Korea Local Informati Information Research and Development Institute. Next page, please. Um, first of all, I'd just like to, the reason why I would like to uh, give you a history of my organization is simply because my organization actually started out as a local informatization foundation in 1997. That's over 20 years ago. And what's important about it is that it comes from, it, it's got a basis from the Electronic Government Act, Article 72. So can you, next page, please. The reason why I point, the, point this out is because the CLIT organization is actually the culmination of uh, uh, policy to implement, uh, let's say, e-government within the local government uh, level within Korea as, as part of a law, as you can see from Article 72 here, uh, at least two local governments can jointly establish uh, the CLIC institution. And what it does is it uses various, let's say, uh, source of funds from the government, the, the central government, as well as the local government, and uh, establish a system that the, all the local government can share together. So I think the thing that sets CLIC apart from other organizations is simply the fact that we are actually uh, the actual vehicle and a mechanism through which the local governments in Korea communicate with each other. So next, please. Uh, I'll just skip this over. You can read it, uh, read it at your leisure. So basically our organization consists of various uh, divisions, but I think I'd just like to point out that uh, the first two left divisions, which I think we can just uh, skip over. One of them is staff and the other one is the uh, policy conversions division. So it's basically policy uh, support. But the other divisions, the administrative information division, fiscal, tax information, cloud computing, and information security, these are the actual organizations that support the local governments in Korea, the intercommunication between these governments, as well as supporting the various systems, which are, let's say, uh, more favorable to uh, the large economy where the actual uh, economic economical benefits can be reaped in through uh, building a larger system than uh, having it fractured into many different uh, systems that each of the local governments will need to invest and operate as well. Next, please. So basically what CLID does, as you can see here, is that we operate and maintain local e-government systems. Um, also, we operate IT security infrastructure to protect the various e-government systems. Uh, also, we are building cloud-based next generation e-government system, as well as developing IT services and policies for the local government. And uh, we are also here to strengthen the manpower of local governments and lead co co cooperation in local information. Next, please. 
So uh, I, I don't have a whole lot of time, so I'll just quickly uh, go through some of the uh, actual services that we provide to the local governments. Basically, uh, we have 44 types of system for public administration. And uh, we also do provide uh, 10 different types of public services. While I would like to get into each one of them, there's very little time. So I would just like to point out that all of these systems are shared among the local governments. So it's a, sort of a uh, information sharing system for all many of most of the Korean local governments. Next, please. Also in the same vein, we also provide various local administration uh, integrated information services as well, uh, stuff that are re related to the fiscal, uh, that's implementation, IT implementation uh, and other city related affairs. Next, please. And also online business processing system that allows uh, all these different, diff different uh, local governments to share information with each other. Next, please. And certainly last but not least, we also provide support for IT security infrastructure to protect all these different types of uh, local e-government systems. Next, please. And um, uh, this is the department I work under, but we also do have policy support for the local governments because many of the governments do actually need some sort of basic support uh, because you know they normally deal with many different types of uh, underground services for the citizens of their respective uh, cities and, and, and uh, local areas. So what we try to do is to provide all the latest information and what needs to be done within uh, those local governments to strengthen the policy support as well as the ma manpower of e all the local governments. Next, please. Well, thank you. I think I kept under five minutes, but I would just like to also add that uh, uh, if you have any questions regarding uh, these different types of uh, information systems and what we actually do as we are the implementation uh, organization for the actual local government uh, intercommunication, feel free to contact me at any time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sang Kim for the very informative presentation and time management. Um, now let's welcome our next speaker, Mr. Sean O'Day from the city of Wellington City. Uh, he's the lead of the city innovation team. Uh, Mr. O'Day, please turn on your camera and microphone. If you're ready, please begin your presentation. The time uh, for presentation is five minutes. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Good, uh, good evening. Um, my name is Sean and I look after the city of Wellington in New Zealand. So if we go to the next slide, I thought um, our definition of innovation is using purpose to drive ideas into everyday reality. And this is what the mission of e-government is for us. So if we go to the next slide, um, what we do is we take departments through a process. First, we make them conscious of the data they create and the impact they have on citizens. Then we give them a purpose. We make sure they engage authentically. Then they align with other departments. And then as a whole city, we begin to advance. So I thought I'd show you what this looks like on the ground. So if we go to the next slide, um, this is what our planning system used to look like. Uh, it was a 10 kilogram document. Uh, you know, when you're weighing documents, they're too big. And what we've done over the last 10 years is take this through a bit of a process. So if we go to the next slide, the first step was to put it into 3D. So this is now 10 years old, which is why it's very blurry. But this three dimensional interactive city allowed us to see height limits, but also the statuses of buildings and was enormously useful to us. If we go forward that next to the next slide, we then began to turn our documents into data. So what this system does is you can click on only your property and on your property or any property in the city, and it will give you only the regulations which apply to you. So it cut down your reading from 10 kilograms to about 500 grams, much more reasonable. So if we go to the next slide, what that looks like today is this system. So this is called Rubric. It's a uh, trial of a technology called Rules as Code. What Rules as Code is, is effectively the code base of legislation being put into a machine executable form. This is what then feeds artificial intelligences, which allow the automation of a new generation of government services. So for example, this one, you can ask at various questions and it will begin to tell you what you can and can't do on a piece of land. So if we go to the next slide, and this is the video, if we want to play that, please. Oh, just one second. So 
the what the video will show you is the new generation of these technologies, which is contributing to our city's digital twin. So, oh dear, this doesn't seem to work. It'll be a long, I imagine. So what the digital twin is doing is, uh, here we are. And if you could just mute the sound, because it's rather annoying. Thank you. Um, so what the digital twin is doing is taking us from a global level all the way down to our nation and our city and allowing us to see Wellington as a completely functioning physical system reflected in its digital space. So every airplane, every boat, every uh, bus entering the city enters the system. We have all of the trees, all of the lampposts are connected to the city's uh, smart lighting system, which are then reflected. So if they break in real life, they break in my model. And we use this to administer the city. We use it to engage with our citizens. And we use it to do things like understand our carbon footprints, um, what the case for new investment in light rail might look like, and then communicate that to our democratically elected representatives and to our, um, our citizens. And so this is being ready for use in our libraries just at the moment. So if we go back to the slideshow, uh, this is a bit jumpy. Um, yes, sir. Here we go. Excellent, thank you. Sorry to be so difficult with the technology. Um, excellent. And so each of our services, so if we go to the next slide, it's gone. Uh, so with each of our technologies, uh, each of our services have been on this journey. So this is a map of the city from after uh, the Kaikoura earthquake. Uh, go back to the map, please. Uh, from after the Kaikoura earthquake. Um, this is where engineers were inspecting all of the large buildings in the city to make sure they're safe to occupy after a 7.8 earthquake on the Richter scale. If we then go to the next slide, you can see what it looked like a few weeks afterwards, where we had completely digitized our workforce. We had put our big city models into action. And what it meant was all the people in the streets collecting observations were being reflected in the model uh, almost instantly. That meant that we could drive decision making a lot faster and we could get in behind places like city businesses to make sure that they reopened. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, this then fed into COVID. So what happened in Wellington during COVID is a uh, massive uh, data effort. So what we did is we created shared data portals, which allowed us to interact with NGOs. We, um, if you go to the next slide, we then, there we go. These shared data portals pulled information in from the NGOs and then gave council an idea of where our money was being spent. So what that meant was we could increase food aid by fourfold within just a few days uh, and keep people safe. We could monitor the effects of lockdowns and we could work with our central government and our community to make sure that we stamped out COVID, which we did, and it hasn't arisen in the city since. And we've been out of it for over a year now. And one of the ways we did it was using these very large e-government platforms. So for example, this one has all the information on all of the hotels in the city so that we could plan what managed isolation looked like and make sure that we uh, didn't have to, that the short-term needs of dealing with quarantine didn't compromise the reopening of the city. So if you go to the next slide, and then what we've done is started to look at the long, longer term economy. Um, so one of the difficulties we have had is COVID has sped up some processes and slowed down some other economic processes. So what you're looking at here are basically all of the vacancies in the buildings at the street level. And then what are the types of industries that are occupying those street frontages? And then what we're using this to understand is what does the future look like for these streets? And then we're using, we've funded over 500 artists to help activate those streets with performances. We've set up pop-up shops. We've done all sorts of things to basically use that data to tailor a response which keeps our economy healthy. And if we step forward another slide, um, you end up with these massive interacting 
reflections of the city government. So at the moment, what we're doing is dividing our city twin into a city twin and a process twin. And between this, we're beginning to change the way we interact with our citizens uh, so that we can drive both better citizen-centered services, but also better, more effective government services for those who can't access digital systems. And if we go to the next slide, now we're starting to understand the world in terms of these shifts. And these shifts are basically what's guiding our thinking so that we can invest in these systems and position the city for the next big uh, challenge, which is how do we move from a post-COVID world to a post-carbon world? We've already decoupled our economic growth from our carbon emissions, and now we need to drive them to zero. So if we go to the next slide, <coughs> it's oh, all okay. from me. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Renee. You are right. <laughs> you were coughing at the end. <laughs> uh, it was, thank you for your presentation. It was a very insightful presentation to learn about many of Wellington's efforts in advancing the government in the uh, city management. Now, moving on to our final speaker, Mr. Tongwen Shin, the project advisor of Seoul Urban Solutions Agency. Mr. Shin, uh, please uh, don't forget to turn your camera and microphone. If you're ready, your presentation uh, can start now. My name is Bang Hoon. Uh, I work at the uh, Seoul Urban Solutions Agency. And before I begin my presentation, very, very briefly. Um, so our institution was established by the Seoul Metropolitan Government to support partner cities um, in their urban sustainable urban development uh, initiatives outside of um, the outside of South Korea. So essentially, we work with our partner cities abroad um, to achieve their sustainable urban development objectives. And we anchor our work on good practices and the development experiences of the city of Seoul. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so just a very brief introduction. You are all aware that Seoul is the capital city of uh, South Korea. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we have a population of 10 million, uh, just over 10 million, which equates to about 25% of the population. And it's one of the most densely uh, populated cities in the world, um, which means that the scale of our local government's operations in the planning and delivery of public services is um, equally astronomical. Our annual budget comes to approximately $26 billion per year and the city employs over 50,000 uh, workers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so. Uh, just to set the context for, um, you know, how e-government came to be in the city of Seoul, um, I just want to briefly explain to you um, the modern history of the city. Um, so it began in the immediate aftermath of the Korean War in the 1950s. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, and as you can see, um, what the city had to work with was really the bare, uh, not even the bare minimum. Um, all of the essential basic infrastructure was completely destroyed by the war. Um, so th even things such as rudimentary road networks, um, basic uh, uh, san sanitation and water uh, piping networks were non-existent. Uh, next slide, please. So in that phase, we focused mostly on restore, uh, rehabilitating and developing basic infrastructure. And starting from approximately the 1980s, to around the year 1990s, this is when we uh, began to um, see a really uh, rapid rise in the population of the city. Um, so with the basic infrastructure in place, what we needed to do was consolidate a lot of the policy frameworks um, and existing infrastructure uh, to accommodate um, the increasing population, um, as well as continued economic development in the city. Um, and this is sort of where uh, e-government really began in the 1990s. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, so, which takes us to around 2000s to, you know, today um, with the coming of, you know, the ICT era, um, we began to see um, uh, a fundamental integration of ICT um, into public service uh, planning and delivery. Um, as well as a fundamental paradigm shift in how the city sees um, its role as a local government. Um, so rather than uh, you know, pure economic growth, it began to focus its policies mostly on sustainability, um, inclusiveness, um, and you know, the concept of a smart city as you know, we're all aware. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so, so I think this one slide really captures um, 
uh, the entire process of how Seoul's e-government sort of evolved throughout the years. Like I mentioned, uh, in the 1990s, it really began, um, the, the e concept of e-government began in the city of Seoul. Um, and it was really rudimentary at first, um, focusing mostly on um, uh, basically computerizing um, document and paper-based information and uh, information into um, uh, you know, uh, databases. Um, and around the late 1990s, um, in terms of e-government and its interactions with the general public, um, basically the launch of the first official website of the city uh, marked the city government's first foray into uh, engaging with the public in the online sphere. Um, and gradually over the next one or two years, it began to incorporate more and more communication channels between the public and uh, the city government through this one website. Um, and organ sort of more or less organically, because this flow of information continued to be more, more and more robust, the city began to realize that it needed to incorporate all of the online information and communication fees into, um, I guess, more um, standardized and formula uh, formalized database uh, storage systems. So that's when it when the need to really expand um, and take a more strategic perspective on e-government really took root. Um, and we're talking roughly around um, the early 2000s. Um, and uh, South Korea is a country where um, mobile and internet pener penetration rates are very high and it achieved this high penetration penetration rate relatively early on. Um, so uh, things like mobile phone usage and smartphone usage um, was very highly prolific, um, even compared to other uh, developed economies um, early on. Um, so because there was this strategic focus on um, maintaining communication, two-way communication between citizens and the city government and the online sphere, um, uh, get, uh, there was a very big emphasis on expanding e-government services and e-government service delivery, um, both through PC and online uh, website format to the mobile format as well. Um, so uh, because on the basis of this communication channel with the general public, um, the city government Understand, uh, understood that um, the information coming in from citizens proved to be a very rich source of information and data, uh, which meant that uh, you know communication channels like this were uh, incorporated into how the city generates data um, to, I guess, develop policies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is sort of uh, how Seoul envisions uh, the approach to smart cities and e-government. Um, so just very briefly, um, the core strategies involved in the vision are basically uh, needs-based. So uh, the communication channel, like I mentioned, um, uh, you know, uh, very robust uh, two-way communication channels with uh, between the citizens and uh, the city government are very important, um, as is leveraging data. So each technical department um, has automated uh, a wide range of automated systems um, and ICT infrastructure in place that generates uh, an enormous amount of data. Um, and all of this is built, built on um, very close partnerships with the private sector. Um, and all of these uh, streams of policy work uh, are basically focused on um, six different uh, core sectors them being transport, safety, environment, welfare, economy, and administration. Next slide, please. Um, so what, uh, the, basically I wanted to tailor my presentation so that it, uh, I can capture some e-government initiatives um, and categorize them according to the different types of challenges and issues that we're trying to tackle with different types of solutions. The first, uh, I want to tackle is fragmented data management. Um, so like I mentioned, the scale of the city government's operations is quite astounding. So we have 
approximately just over 500 different types of information systems operational in the city. Um, and these are generating thousands of terabytes of data, um, which all need to be, um, you know, basically categorized and um, analyzed um, in order to create, you know, data driven policies that are accurate and um, can be impactful. But since each different technical department used to operate their systems individually, there was no standardized framework um, through which uh, all of the data can be uh, easily accessed and curated. Um, so this posed an enormous administrative hurdle for the city, um, not to mention the, I guess, interdepartmental friction um, it caused in the sense that you know different departments didn't want to share the data that they had because it kind of intruded upon their own authority. Um, so in order to resolve all this, uh, next slide, please. Mr. Shane, I'm going to have yeah. to ask you to wrap up in 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. Can you do that for us? <laughs> uh, I'll try. Um, so you. we recently launched the S-Data to over S-Data um, project to overcome this issue, which is essentially a big data lake uh, project that um, integrates all of these different information systems and data sets into one common um, data storage architecture. Next slide, please. Uh, and the digital mayor's office is an integrated uh, smart city platform, data platform um, that basically curates all of this data um, for decision makers to support, uh, you know, evidence-based uh, policy planning. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, there are a lot of different systems we have um, specifically tailored to in, uh, engage directly with citizen groups across uh, different types of formats. Um, and these are all aimed at uh, improving governance um, and ensuring that citizen views are taken into account when we create policies, um, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, and there's also, uh, previous slide, please, a, a need to continuously innovate um, in coordination with individual citizens as well as uh, businesses in the city. Um, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so there is a big focus on open data. Um, and basically all of the data that's uh, being generated by the city's uh, information systems are shared with the public and different businesses through the Open Data Plaza uh, portal. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and the Seoul Big Data Campus is essentially a, a, a smaller scale version of the Open Data platform um, where uh, different entrepreneurs um, can work with data sets in a more closed and curated environment. Uh, yeah, so next slide, please. I think that's the end. Um, so yeah, sorry, I had to kind of rush through everything, but uh, I hope it gave you a little bit of sense of, um, you know, sort of uh, how the Seoul Metropolitan Government envisions uh, e-government policy. Thank you, Mr. Shin. Yes, it was very insightful that, uh, to learn about how Seoul's government, uh, e-government policy is developed with the specific case examples. Some of the examples that you weren't able to explain uh, during the presentation, maybe you can link to um, how uh, to our panel, uh, second panel discussion, and then maybe showcase a little bit one or more uh, two examples that you were going to introduce to us during the presentation. Maybe we can hear it in the uh, second part of the discussion. So this will be the end of the first session and we'll be moving on to the next session where all the speakers that we've invited for the session well, will be moving on to a uh, panel discussion. And all to all of the participants, kindly uh, leave your question to speakers in the Q&A box and we will be addressing them directly to the speakers at the end of the uh, webinar. Um, First of all, I would like to introduce our moderator of session two, Mr. Dimitris Centrenis, uh, who is the postdoctoral fellow at United Nations University E-Government Center. He also worked as a researcher in E-Government Unit in Decision Systems uh, Laboratory of School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the National Technology University of Athens. Mr. Centrinis, if you're ready, please uh, lead us to the discussion with the panelists. And don't forget to turn your camera and microphone. Nice thank you very much. Yes, you can hear me, I suppose. Yes? Yes, we can all hear you. Great. Thank you. 
So yes, uh, I welcome you also from my site on session number two, entitled Expansive Exploration on E-Government of WeGo E-Government Thematic Group. So yes, my name is Dimitris Aradis and I'm a research fellow in United Nations University in operating unit on policy-driven electronic governance in Guimarães in Portugal. Through this session, participants will have the opportunity to discover the evolution of e-government along with the best practices of proven worth and will observe how multi-stakeholder cooperation can provide new angles to help cities step up their government ecosystems. So we have uh, invited in this session um, uh, different participants from government, corporations, or institutions to share their experiences. Uh, in this interactive uh, Q&A session, discussants uh, will share their thoughts on e-government from their respective perspective and explore in depth to identify ways advanced cities e government ecosystems at different levels of development. So I invite uh, our viewers to use Q&A interaction feature in the platform to address their questions to the speakers. And uh, we will try to address them at the end of uh, the session. Uh, okay, I don't want to waste any more uh, time, so I'm going to briefly introduce the new speakers we have now. Uh, the first uh, new speaker, new participant here in this session is uh, Nai Mekardanian, who is uh, the director of Municipal Smart City Office in the city of Siraz. And we have also Ilya Feigin, from, who is a cyber security strategist from Samsung. SDS. Uh, I would like to, to ask uh, participants, speakers, to have to keep their uh, microphones off when they don't uh, speak. Um, also, we'll have the opportunity discussions from session one to participate in this session. And I uh, will uh, quickly start with the agenda, with the first agenda which has to do with uh, implementation. And uh, here we, we will try to, to answer briefly in the question that asks how can local governments improve their e-government services to become more pragmatic and beneficial to citizens? Um, what is the, the level of development, the analysis of development here? Do we have, are there any common goals in this effort uh, for example, do we have infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure projects that help this um, effort, uh, e-identities, e-payment source, smart mobility applications? So I think here, uh, as we listened in the previous uh, session, uh, it's a good opportunity for uh, Mr. Dong uh, Hon Sin um, to say uh, to say us to explain us a few more things since. He didn't have the time to present them in the previous session. So uh, please, uh, Mr. Dong Hussein, uh, uh, give us uh, your view in uh, four, four or five minutes about this. How can local governments improve their government services? Please. Yeah. Um, so again, apologies for having to rush through my presentation towards the end. Um, but uh, one thing that uh, I think a lot of uh, local governments kind of get wrapped up on is this very, uh, you know, project based mentality um, in the sense that, you know, they're rushing um, to develop different types of solutions and different project ideas and rush to implement them um, and roll out different services out into the field um, without really taking stock of, you know, how it is that we're going to be delivering these types of services. So um, in the case of Seoul, um, certain challenges in terms of the delivery of e-government services, especially early on that the city faced, um, kind of revolved around um, twin issues of lack of awareness um, among the general public um, and lack of capacity among the general public as to how it is um, and why it is that they should use different types of e-services. Um, so, I mean, the, uh, essentially what, uh, so in the long term, um, low engagement among citizens um, in the e-government sphere, uh, I guess from the experience of Seoul has been, you know, uh, sort of eroding public trust um, in different types of government initiatives, especially online. 
Um, so the first issue that I mentioned is, you know, lack of awareness. I think this is a fairly straightforward um, issue to tackle. Um, Keeping uh, mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, there needs to be an integration in both online and offline efforts in terms of reaching out to the citizen groups, uh, different cities, citizen groups. And this is uh, very much um, in Seoul's case, it, it's been a very effective um, way to induce engagement among different citizens. Um, and I wanted to add on that different types of incentives for engaging with local governments on the in the online sphere um, has been very important. Um, so these types of incentives can range from things very being very simple, like you know providing free coffee coupons um, if you use this e-government uh, service for the first time, to a little bit more complex uh, incentives like you know uh, differentiated tax incentives um, for certain types of e-government services. Um, and this has most recently been tried um, with an online uh, e-payment service um, that the Seoul Metropolitan Government uh, launched relatively recently. Um, uh, and in terms of you know, lack of capacity, um, I think this also ties into the first presentation uh, in the sense that e-government needs to be inclusive. And there are definitely uh, more vulnerable segments of the society, of society, um, that uh, might have more difficulty accessing e-government services. Um, uh, two examples that I can cite immediately off the top of my head tend to be the lower economically, um, uh, the lesser economically uh, able, uh, in the sense that you know, uh, you know, data plans cost money, um, and without access to data plans, they most certainly won't be able to access e-government services online. Um, so um, the free public Wi-Fi initiative in Seoul has been a very big pillar of reducing this digital uh, gap uh, in society to ensure that e-government services are widely available, um, no matter you know what your economic circumstances might be. Uh, another is you know basic digital capacity building. So um, uh, demographically speaking, the elderly are most at risk here uh, in the sense that they might not know how to use certain technologies. They might not know different uh, types of services um, that are tailored for the elderly exist online. So it's very important that different e-government services are accompanied by uh, capacity building efforts um, that are specifically targeted for uh, you know some of the more vulnerable segments of society to ensure that they are aware of different types of services and that they can actually make use of these different types of services. Thank you, thank you very much for your um, participation. And um, then let's move to, let's ask the same question um, regarding, uh, let's ask uh, Mr. Sean O'Dean from Wellington. Uh, how can local governments improve their government services to become more pragmatic and beneficial to citizens? Well, the first thing to recognize is that uh, the most important part of e-government is government. We are there to govern for the people uh, and support the democracy they set over us. So understanding how you can use technology to support that democracy is vital. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, public trust has grown in our government um, over the past year, one of the very, very few Western democracies where that has happened. And one of the reasons for this is we have taken a much more nuanced approach to a technological investment. So one of the biggest questions we are exploring at the moment is indigenous data sovereignty. Often our cultural values are built into the technologies and the way we deploy those technologies uh, into our cities. Uh, for our Indigenous people, those ideas of identity and those ideas of measurement are not the same as they are for uh, the places in Europe or Asia or even in Pākehā society that make those. Um, and therefore, we have to do things a little differently. And we found that particularly with COVID tracing. Uh, the second piece is about being strategic. Um, and that means that 
what we are doing is setting each department off on a common course of digitizing and moving from a essentially a document-based way of governing to a data-based way of governing. Uh, but we need to do it in a way that converges, but also causes enough competition that those departments compete. And so often what we'll do is things like uh, hackathons or community-based ways of doing things. Um, and then we'll use what we call market shaping approaches, which is using the power of the public sector to shape the, the way that procurement and the way that markets operate so that we get the maximum benefit for our citizens. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so let's move now to the second part of our agenda, um, which is uh, diversified hindrances and obstacles. So the main question here that we will try to address is what uh, struggles uh, do local governments face in upgrading the government systems and how can this be overcome? Uh, so mainly in this, across different sectors, we have different needs and struggles. So we'd like to, to specify those ones. Also, we, we face challenges. These have maybe have to do with policies, with restrictions, with uh, appropriate regulations to adopt technologies in the government. Uh, for example, we, we heard uh, in the previous session a uh, problem with fragmented data and how uh, departments handle this issue. They don't want to share the data. So what are the, the main obstacles that we face? Uh, I would like to, to invite uh, Mr. Kipin Yao from United Nations Project Office on Governance to, to address uh, for us some uh, obstacles. Mr. Kipin Yao. Thank you, Dimitrius. Actually, in my uh, presentation, I already mentioned several kind of key issues, or key obstacles you know, on the this. I think the first one is about this, uh, uh, how to say, um, because the digital transformation or adoption of the latest technology is not about the technology per se. The, for example, digital transformation is about not a digital, but a transformation is more about a people and a process. Yeah. So, uh, so the most important thing is that uh, the political leaders and also the government officials, they should change the mindset. They should be get prepared for, to embrace the uh, digital transformation and ready to adopt the, the technology. I think that's the most imp first important. And the local leaders, of course, they should buy in and also they should realize that the, um, the technologies and the digital government could uh, uh, be a very kind of uh, enabler for the uh, local development. And then secondly, as I just mentioned that uh, the, even at a local level, uh, the, all the institutions, some institutions, they get used to uh, working in you know, that uh, they do not uh, share the data, they do not uh, work together in collaboration. And also the third one, maybe it's also, uh, there's no kind of centralized uh, platform, the lack of inter interoperability, that's also not, that's a, also another big issue. The fourth issue is about the open innovation. Because have never before uh, that uh, the, the partnership with the private sector and also even with the individuals, with academia, uh, that's uh, become so important. You know, the government should open, has a open the platform, should open a dialogue and work together with the other stakeholders to address all the kind of challenges. Yeah. And also, uh, lastly, uh, when we uh, talk about this, uh, all the uh, latest technology, the key or the core of this technology is about the data. So we should have like a data governance framework to also get the trust from the from uh, citizens and other stakeholders here. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dimitrios. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, ask the same question regarding uh, obstacles. Uh, um, in Mrs. Uh, Naime Cardanian, uh, Director of Municipal Smart City Office in Siraz. Please turn on your microphone. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Najma Karganyan, and I'm an MS holder in ICT software development. Yeah. 
in ICT software development with, uh, and I have been with the IT organization of Shiraz Municipality since, since 2016. I'm now an acting director of a smart city office where I'm in charge of managing and running a smart city related projects. We're going to share our experience and thoughts on e-government from our experience uh, respective. My presentation contains two main parts, e-government challenges and e-government challenge ahead. E-government challenges. This is a list of factors and challenges related to the e-government based, uh, based on our experience and thoughts. First of all is organizational and human resource resistance uh, that have categorized to the three levels. First of all is organization, on the second level, human resources, and finally at the third level, private sectors and citizens. On the organization level, um, Main challenges are uses of organizational diversity, lack of alignment on organizational goals and projects, and uh, multiple and uh, conflicting goals. Organization must adapt to the new changes through the culture and the way they organize their work. New and innovative ways are required to change the way of operating and doing things in order to cope with an organizational culture oriented. Second, uh, on the human level resistance, one of the challenge is uh, manager's attitude and behavior. The biggest challenge for change can be mindset and attitudes. The government members uh, will make a transition from a bureaucratic model to an innovative model that will enable coordination. It is important to analyze the current organizational culture and lead the way towards an open mindset and confer significance to the work. The other challenge is resistance to change. Excuse me. The other challenge is uh, resistance to change. Change are complex, thus it is necessary to assess both which type of change is required and the time it will take. The effectiveness of the planned change is related to the members' participation in all organizational levels. It must be borne in mind that organizational change contemplate people as well. And finally, the rule of a trans, um, transparent governance process should replace personal decisions in an organization. Private sectors and citizens. The building of a government requires several changes in values beliefs and assumption, not only from the government leaders and employees, but also from the private sectors and citizens. It's important to achieve inv uh, investments of human and social capital by training and sharing of knowledge to them. They have to believe that e-government projects are going to improve the quality of life and sustainability of the city. Another challenge is coordination failures in national and local policies. The next challenge is uh, the lack of coordination structure. We have different coordination structures according to the levels at which information and physical flow of integration are shared from the point of view of opera operation management. At the first level, information is shared and there is no integration. On the second level, information is shared and there is no integration. And finally, at the third level, all the information is shared and there is integration. Another challenge is budget pressure. Uh, at first, high cost of project implementation. And the second one is finance for innovation in public services and the challenge of rollout. 
Next challenge is investment that has two points of view. Targeted investment in infrastructure has significant impact on city performance. Failure to invest in skills on infrastructure has long-term knock-on effects on cities and their people. Among the successful urban investment strategies, the following can be mentioned. A business model suitable for investment and public participation in ICT project. Develop a business model for a startup in urban management projects. And finally, use of international investment business model. Next challenge is increasing citizens' expectations. With the increase of e-government services, citizens' expectation from the municipality and other service provider will increase, which require planning to support and provide appropriate services in line with community expectations. Another challenge is restrictions uh, on access to modern technology. In recent years, in some cases, there have been restrictions on access to technology and equipment needed for projects. We should identify solutions for supply or if it is possible, implement them. And finally, e-government challenge ahead. One of the most important challenges ahead is privacy. The issue here our privacy and trust. Citizens will fear that data tracked by innovative technology can be used for purpose that they do not intend or may not even know about. And, and therefore, citizens must have a choice of whether to allow government to use the, their data or not. Thank you. For your listening, uh, Thank you very much for the, uh, your presentation, Ms. Cardanian. It's very useful to, to our discussion. Um, many challenges that we have to, to face. <laughs> and moving now to the third uh, agenda, uh, the third part, which is um, uh, the prospect uh, for e-government. Uh, what are the next steps for uh, e-government? What would be the next step that we should do to, to move on? What are some measures that the local governments can adopt? For example, uh, should we move on mobile government services? Um, should we uh, concentrate on public and private partnerships, outsourcing or co-sourcing? Some people uh, um, mentioned the ideas of uh, bringing private sector and citizens in, uh, in digital government uh, efforts data-driven government, security, privacy issues that uh, we heard regarding trust uh, from citizens, affordability of digital services, and which are the most recent initiatives in the government field. So in this uh, discussion, in this part, I would like to, to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Ilya Feizin from uh, Samsung to tell us a few things, Mr. Feizin. Uh, thank you, Dimitrius. Uh, this is indeed a very timely question. So, um, as I've been hearing the presentation, I see uh, each city is trying to do two things. They're trying to better the lives uh, of their residents to provide better services, and at the same time, cut uh, costs and, uh, and increase efficiency. Uh, in doing this, uh, cities are becoming more and more digitalized. And now with COVID-19, it's even more extreme because there are many more specific services that are for COVID-19, for example, services to get tested, to find masks, to get treated, find vaccines, and so forth. So the more cities are becoming uh, digital and, uh, and moving to this uh, di digital, uh, um, di digital uh, state, they're also increasing the attack surface for cyber attacks to their systems. Uh, and the risks are substantial. And one of the key risks uh, is the ransomware. Uh, and uh, there are two things happening with ransomware. First, the number of attacks is increasing, but also uh, more uh, frighteningly, 
the um, uh, amount of ransom requested in the attacks is also increasing substantially. It used to be $30,000 in a ransomware attack, but now it can be half a million dollar and going upward, depending of, of course on the size uh, and the economy of the city. And so we have uh, some examples like in, in Atlanta in 2018, uh, in US there was a ransomware attack and five of the city's 13 departments were hit. And for five days, the systems were, were down. Uh, in the end, all in all, the city of Atlanta had to pay around nine and a half million dollar, um, million of dollars to remediate uh, the attack. Uh, another example, the city of Baltimore, also in US, uh, so they decided they're not going to pay any ransom uh, and they just uh, dealt with, uh, with the costs associated with damages and remediation of the attacks. And still it was $18 million. So it's very significant amounts. Um, but uh, so uh, of course, uh, financial hit is, is a very serious uh, problem for city, but even more important is uh, a bodily injury to, to uh, city, uh, city residents. And uh, in uh, February this year, in the city of Oldsmar in Florida, the city of uh, 15,000 inhabitants, uh, hackers were able to increase the level of sodium hydroxide by 100. And this could have resulted in poisoning that could cause burns, vomiting, severe pain, bleeding. And uh, luckily, the uh, city water authority employees were able to notice the attack as it was happening. And they were able to, uh, to reduce the level of the chemical back to normal, so no poisoning happened, but the risks here are, are astronomical. And the question is, uh, okay, so we have these risks, but how do we remediate, uh, remediate them? And the way uh, we look at it is to, so we have three main components of, of a system. We have the core of the system, which has a cloud platform, the IoT data platform, all of the services that now we heard in presentation presentation uh, from Seoul and, and uh, Wellington and, uh, and others. Uh, all of the systems would be, would be core system, basically providing services to uh, the residents. And uh, uh, then in the middle, and then on the other extreme, we have the edge, uh, edge system, I, IoT sense, uh, systems. It could be smart lighting, smart trash collector. There could be traffic light actuator. Uh, sensor. So the gentleman that uh, from Wellington described earthquake uh, sensors. So most likely this um, uh, earthquake sensors would be IoT sensors. And uh, so we would need to secure those. And in between the core and the, and the edge, we have the communication layer. So the communication could be done using Wi-Fi, 5G, LT, Ethernet, and so forth. And so to, to secure, uh, let's talk about the cloud, the, the core system, to secure the core system, we would need to, to put a cloud protection mechanism like a cloud workload protection, uh, workload protection platform, cloud security posture management. Of course, we have an application firewall and the other similar system. Of course, I cannot list uh, all of them. I'm, I'm just mentioning the, the key ones. Uh, as for communication layer, we would definitely need uh, uh, to segment the network into using firewalls. If we need to use VPN, we would need to use this as well. And for, for the edge, and uh, edge is uh, especially an important topic because there is an exponential growth in the amount of IoT devices uh, in cities and then in, in the industry, uh, basically everywhere. Um, and to secure this IoT devices, which are, which our cities are relying more and more on, we need to do several things. First, we need to harden the devices themselves. We need to make sure that if, for example, we have a CCTV camera, it only does what CCTV is supposed to do. It, uh, it monitors what, what happens around it. It, uh, it. it cannot be used for other attacks on other systems uh, elsewhere. And, and at the same time, we also need to make sure we segment uh, the network uh, very carefully and make sure that if somebody was able to hack into this IoT CCTV camera, he, he cannot uh, continue the hack into to the core system and into communication system or to other uh, IoT systems. So I think uh, uh, this covers the type of systems that I would, uh, I would implement uh, in a city, but also very importantly, we have to continuously do periodic penetration testing and security audits. 
And is the reason we need we cannot just do it once and forget about is, is uh, for two reasons. First, uh, we have sys systems uh, keep being deployed, like we had with uh, with the COVID nineteen example. It's completely new systems that were probably were deployed in having human lives in mind, but not necessarily cybersecurity in mind. And, and also, while uh, while we, we 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 are protecting the hackers, keep improving their their methods and keep improving their techniques and uh, and we need to keep uh, testing our systems and uh, to make sure that uh, uh, hackers would not be able to hack them and um, thank you thank you very much for uh, mr Faisin for for this um, um <coughs> participation for this um, uh, introduction of this um, consideration of cyber cyber security issues which are very important uh, i would like to to come back with a question to mr sino then regarding how how can we engage or how do you engage the vulnerable groups in your city when you design the purposeful services for meeting their special needs is there any consideration of that in your uh... so it depends on the group um if it is say uh, we were looking at how do we improve the warmth and dryness of our houses we have a notoriously bad housing stock in new zealand that was looking at what is the trust relationship going to be so what the best way to do that for us was to uh, invest through social enterprises uh, the reason for that was the social enterprises could hold the council to account on its own houses, but also they could build the trust and relationships through building the devices with the tenants. Uh, so they knew how they worked, they understood that they weren't being bugged and that they could then uh, control their own data. Some other groups are a bit more difficult. Quite often the best way to do it is to create composite teams between city officials, government officials and members of that community. Uh, and then very occasionally, what we'll do is do something for a community, but in such a way as it is run as a trial so that they can see very quickly what it does and what it doesn't do, and then work out if it's going to be successful or not. Thank you very much. Okay, closing now the session, I would um, try to summarize. We had uh, many ideas, many considerations. Um, regarding uh, digital government and local level so uh, in bullets uh, i could say that um, we should not uh, be only focused on uh, project-based mentality not rushing but uh, consider uh, really the uh, the people the citizens needs uh, what are the uh, the needs that we should satisfy uh, we should um, also um, consider um, a digital capacity of uh, all groups, vulnerable, especially vulnerable, uh, vulnerable groups, to consider the public trust, to, to gain the public trust uh, in our initiatives, uh, use technology to support uh, democracy. Uh, as we heard, not all people consider uh, concepts, ideas, uh, and principles in the same way. Um, Purpose-driven, our initiative should be purpose-driven, uh, open data, uh, offer to support uh, um, initiative startups, uh, establish centralized platforms to ensure inter interoperability, uh, avoid the uh, silos, uh, align, which is very important that we see that also in our um, research, align local government strategies with national ones. Um, use of, now that we face recently, use of artificial intelligence to automate provider services. We saw the, the example of digital twin um, before. Um, then we, we move to, to challenges. We have to, uh, political leaders should be prepared to, um, to help in this uh, digitization of our society. We have the lack of buy-in from political leaders, as we heard. Um, 
What else? We have organizational and human resources resistance. This is a permanent issue that we face it in public administration. Um, lack of alignment of organizational goals, multiple and conflicting goals. Um, and then we move to, to the next steps where we, we should consider, of course, cybersecurity aspects like the ransomware problem that we, it's getting uh, uh, continuously uh, more important, more significant, and causes uh, serious problems. We, it can cause, we heard also, health problems to citizens. Uh, then uh, we should uh, move on uh, designing digital government services um, in a way that uh, can support achievement of sustainable development goals and uh, generally support sustainability and inclusiveness in our initiatives, leaving no one behind. Um, and many more that maybe I have uh, forget some uh, issues to say. I would like now to, to remind you because in uh, United Nations University, we are participating in the uh, United Nations uh, e-government survey, which is a biannual uh, publication. And uh, regarding specifically in the local online service index uh, assessment uh, that was mentioned also before, uh, we are um, preparing now the next edition. So uh, I would uh, like to um, to remind you that m many of you maybe you already know that the um, local government questionnaire deadline is on 15 of June and we will conduct the um, LOSI analysis, the assessment of uh, local services during uh, this uh, summer. So uh, uh, whoever would like more information about that or uh, any help uh, can also contact me. So, this is uh, the end of the session. I would like to, to thank all the participants for their contribution. Uh, and uh, I would like to close it here. Thank you very much, all. Thank you, Mr. Sarantis, for summarizing the good points of the lessons learned today and about the great moderation. Um, also, I would also like to thank all of the panelists uh, uh, that were here with us today for sharing and contributing to a fruitful discussion. Um, if any of the questions submitted have not been answered uh, today, we will make sure to deliver the answers uh, to you separately via email after the end of today's event. Um, this will be the end of uh, Wigui -Wigu Government a thematic group webinar. Uh, before we close, I'm sharing with you the answers to government quiz answers e-government quiz answers that were shared with the people uh, when they were registering. Uh, the selected three winners will be getting, next slide, getting the three winners will be selected, the, uh, the three winners will be selected and uh, they'll be getting an email from the secretary with the prize. So the answers are on the screen, so you can check the answers. And uh, once again, a big thank you to all WIGO members and partners and friends for joining us today for the first WIGO Government Thematic Group webinar. And we look forward to working with together with you in this initiative on uh, virtually or in person very soon. Thank you and wish you a pleasant rest of the day. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone.